was a trucker, and he said he and a better buddy who was a member of the church, who was also a trucker, they had forgotten, and they couldn't get through to the, the, the forest in town. And they asked me, he asked me if I would take care of that. This is a Wednesday, it seems like. No, it's a Wednesday this year. Maybe it wasn't. It just, I knew there was other things I really wanted to do than find someone else's life's flowers and stuff. Anyway, so I call the florist and get a busy signal and nothing. They're not answering. I, I've been around florists and they're done. They have enough. They're making enough money. They don't have time to do one more. So they're not answering the phone. Well, I saw they had a fax number, so I sent a fax and I said, Eddie, whatever, and uh, whoever else, uh, they forgot to get fly for a while. So they asked me to let you know, so please do that. And I didn't give an option, didn't say, I said, they, they'll spend 25 feet. I didn't care how much money it was. <laughs> and boy, I tell you what, that florist called me right back in one second. And she said, we weren't answering for a reason. I go, no, we weren't. But you answered your facts, and now you got to get them something. Uh, don't expect that from me this year, though, please. <laughs> now, the pastor began the service with a prayer. He said, oh, Lord, give us clean hearts. Give us pure hearts. Give us sweet hearts. And every girl in the congregation ever said, amen. Give us sweet hearts. You know, too often we kind of treat God that way um, when we come to him. We come to him when we want something. We come to him when we need something. Uh, when something's missing and <clears throat> when something's just wrong, that's when we come to God. And that's okay. God wants us to come to Him. But sometimes that's the only time. And, and we think that uh, if God fixes this problem, if He answers this prayer, if he, if he settles this issue in my life, then I'll be a happy, content servant of God. But there's always something. My son got a job a year, I think a year ago. And everything was great except for one thing. <laughs> except for one thing. I said, you know, that sounds familiar. There's always something that requires, for believers anyway, requires some kind of faith. Uh, it's just, you may know, you may find out in the beginning like he did, or sometimes it takes a while. It's, not, it's just not perfect. There's some area that, that requires faith, and you keep coming to God about it. Uh, but you know, uh, there's always something that, that's, that's also keeping us from where we need to be spiritually. And it may be that one thing or this thing, or maybe that we're not walking in obedience, or maybe we're just not listening. If we're not listening, we can't follow. Today I want us to look at a passage that, that teaches us about how to experience God. And Okay, we're using that word a lot, those words a lot here recently. What does that even mean? What to experience God means to have that relationship with God, where we know Him. He already knows us, but where we know Him, where we can... We can hear his voice and understand it and know what he's saying and leading us to do. Just talking about that relationship with God that, that he created us to have. It's not about church attendance or being good. It, it's so much more. It's being in that place of fulfillment because God is in our life and he's filling us with his presence. But it all starts with what we're looking for. What are we looking for? When we talk about experience God, we talk about spiritual things. What are, what are you looking for? Are you looking for all the problems to be solved? Good luck with that. There's always something that drives us back to Him. Are you looking for like perfect behavior? Maybe, maybe your wife or husband is, uh, and you. That's probably not what we're looking for. But what are we looking for? First, we must be committed to God's purpose. In Philippians 2.13, the Bible says, It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. It's God who works in you. So it's God who's working in our hearts to help us to obey him. He's always working in our hearts. And he's working in our hearts so that we might can hear his voice. So that we can hear him and that we can please him. And he gives us the energy. He's working to will and not only so that we'll have that desire, but to act according to his good purpose, to, to do what he wants us to do. He's working in us to get us to that place. And sometimes we work with him, sometimes we're working against him. God's working in our lives. He's leading us to have the desire to do the good works that he has created us to do. His will, his purpose. God's purpose began a long time before we were born. It began a long time before the scripture I read where uh, 
where Moses spoke to the spies and sent out spies and God told him to send out spies. Way before that, you go back to Genesis 12 and uh, we see where God spoke to Abraham. In verse 1 to 3, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse them who curses you. And in all, and in you, listen to this part, I love this part, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we go back to to the Lord speaking to Abram, Abraham soon to be, and we see God's purpose. So we, we move forward then. His descendants, they, they went to Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt. You know, God raised up Moses. Well, three months after being rescued from Egypt, the Lord told Moses to tell the people about the greater purpose that he had for them. And we see that in Exodus 19, verses 5, 6. He said, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, same covenant made with Abraham, Jacob and Isaac, Isaac and Jacob. Then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So now we see it's gone from being a great nation and being a blessing, and blessing all the, the, the families of the earth, to now you're a special treasure, you're a kingdom of priests, you're a holy nation. Okay, we always talk about the promised land. Uh, the sports announcer at our college where our kids, uh, Jackson coaches, and Joe Beth is finishing up, where we attended, he's done it for like 20, 30 years. When you score a touchdown, you hit the promised land. And so, and so he counts down the yard, 20, 10, 5. He's in the promised land. Well, he's not talking about that kind of promised land. Um, the land was great. The promised land, this, this little bitty area in that part of the world. Tiny, if you look at a map, it's tiny. It's great. It's where they would be based. It was God's gift to them. But that, that wasn't it. That wasn't their purpose, just receiving this promised land. God promised to make them a great nation. Not just to have a great piece of land, but their greatness revolved around the great purpose that he had for them. Not the mountains and the valleys and the fertile soil and, and the cities they would build and the, the chariots, the armies they would have later, their wealth. No, it had to do with the purpose that he gave them. They would be a blessing to all the earth. That's, that was a great purpose. You'll be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Their purpose was to be a kingdom of priests. A kingdom, those ruling would be priests. What does that mean? A priest is someone that represents God to man and leads people to God. So their purpose as a nation would be a kingdom of priests. When just to have this promised land, they would be representing God to all the world, all the nations. It wasn't about them being the greatest nation. Yeah, he says, I'll make you a great nation. But their greatness was found in their purpose. Not in their achievements. His purpose for them. He says, you'll be a holy nation. That doesn't, doesn't mean they'll be perfect. That everyone needs to look at them at their perfection. We found out real quick they're not perfect. A holy nation is they are set aside for God. Holy means to be set apart. Dedicated for the Lord to the Lord's service. So they would be a holy nation. The purpose of, of, of bringing the people, the nations of the world to God. So how would they be such a blessing to the world? Well, the Messiah, the Messiah, the, the Savior would come from their nation. Jesus would come from this, these people. These were his, his people. And the Messiah would be for all the nations. He would lead them to a relationship with God based on faith. Well, when he was finished saying, reminding them of their purpose, the Bible says in verse 8, Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They signed the covenant. They signed the document in their hearts. We will do. We understand that, that they understood that there was a great purpose. But it wasn't all filled in. It wasn't all completed. They had no idea what this purpose would become. They just knew God had a purpose. Sometimes we, we pray, we want the answer, we want to know the direction, we want the, we want the plan, the map to what God wants us to do. Well, that's not how it works. 
He told Abram, I want to lead you to a land I will show you. He didn't say, here it is. No, leave everything you know. Leave everything you are. You find protection and comfort and strength in. Leave it all because I'm going to take you to a place that you don't even know. That requires faith. And it still does. To follow him, we have to accept this great purpose. Trusting him. Trusting in who God is and what his purpose is. They didn't have all the details of the plan, but they committed to the purpose God had for them. The promise is that God is giving the land of Canaan to the children of Israel, the promised land. That's great. But faith is required to, to see that promise, to believe that promise, to, to do our part in following and accepting, receiving that promise. And that faith is established when we put our faith and trust in God and we commit to his purpose. That's what we're doing when we, 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 whether it's at the altar or in your house or at a camp, wherever it might have been, where we say, God, I, things aren't working. I can't, I'm not, it's not working. I can't save myself. I, and I put my faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for my sins and I accept him into my life and then I accept his purpose. His purpose of he is Lord and I'm his servant. And wherever he leads and whatever he calls me to do, I'm his servant. He's my Lord. When you have faith, it doesn't matter what stands in your way or how you feel or what you see. We have emotions and we, we're people, we have feelings, but our faith rises above those things. And we move, we act, we're obedient. Paul calls it, uh, I take these thoughts and put them into captivity. Whether the thoughts of lust or thoughts of greed or thoughts of pride. He says, I have them, but I, I take those thoughts captive and submit them to God. Because he has faith to continue to follow him. And when you have that kind of faith, you understand that it's, this, this work is not dependent on me or on my faith, but it's dependent on God. Years ago, my first church, uh, this guy named was Bo. He was even on the search committee. He's probably his mid fifties. He was like a supervisor at some kind of uh, steel plant. I have no idea what that means. What he did, but uh, that's where that's where he worked. And he was always really busy, really really active guy. And uh, he used to take up golf. Took up golf. And he told me how good he was. And I played a little back then. And he sounded like he was really good. Well, a few weeks later, he came and he said, I'm going to shoot something up, John. Took me over to his car after church. I opened his trunk. He's got one of these new, huge uh, drivers. And, well, he can drive it, you know, how I many yards he can drive it. And I said, well, that's great. Um, then a few weeks later, he says, uh, Brother John, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join the senior tour. And I remember he just started playing like two months before. Maybe a prodigy, I don't know. I hadn't played with him, so... He's going to join the senior tour. Uh, the professional golfer's tour. He says, I think I can make enough money. I'm going to build that church we need to build. Well, we were cramped. We needed a new building. And I looked at him, and I thought, well, that'd be great. Well, Bo quit teaching his class. Bo quit coming to church because he was playing golf every Sunday. Because he had transferred this dream of his into God's dream. God's plan, God's purpose. And I'm not, I am criticizing Bo, but not above myself because we all do this. We get, we get excited about, about God working in our life and we, we, we see something we like, we see something we enjoy, we see something we want, whatever it is, and somehow we kind of twist it and, until we've crammed it into this box of this is God's promised land for me. As you read this part of the Bible, it, it seems only to be about the promised land sometimes. But God's purpose is so much bigger and better than just the promised land. His purpose was life-changing. Now, we might, it might not be golf, but, but, you know, preachers are the worst about it. Okay, pastors, we're the worst about it, I'll admit. Because we'll twist it into the, the, the four Bs. Uh, buildings, budgets, baptisms, and... And maybe just being good. That's what we become. That's what we begin to focus on. Are these things that we think indicate growth or indicate maturity or whatever. And, and we get away and we begin thinking that's the promised land. 
that's not the end of it. That's not the that's not the the whole purpose. God He wants us to be a part of His purpose. But we get lost in the details and we make it about us and we make that part of God's plan the part that we can control, the part that makes us proud, or thought that we get to the part that we get excited about. We lose sight of God's purpose and we settle for how it makes us look or how it makes us feel. And it becomes about money or things or power or popularity instead of God's purpose. When we come to Christ, we accept Him in our life, like I said earlier. We accept His Lordship over our lives. And we surrender to His purpose for our lives. If you watch the video today, then you heard Black and me talk about that. I mean, instead of praying about what I'm going to do, we pray, God, how can you use me in accomplishing your purpose? And we surrender to his purpose for our life, and we say, where you lead, I'll follow. And we let go of those purposes that we have, some that are great and they're honorable, but they're not so good if they become before God's. We must be committed to his purpose. Second, though, we must be, we must be confident in God's plan. We must be confident in God's plan. God initiated this conversation. We saw that with Abraham. We see it again with Moses. And extended this invitation to work with him as he accomplished his purpose. And it's so important that we listen carefully to God's plan. Because we, we have to be confident in it. If we're not, we're going to go for the next thing we see. We're going to be blown to and fro by the winds, as James talks about. But faith reminds us that if God is leading, then it's going to end up, it's going to end up well. That's all Abraham had. All. That's all he had. Go to the land I will show you. Well, his faith was in God, so he knew if this is God, it's going to, it's going to work out. It's going to be good. I don't have to worry about that. And, of course, he went through the trials of time after time, beginning to worry about it. But Romans 12, 2 says, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? It's good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect, it's complete. So let's look at what God was doing. Back to uh, Numbers. The Lord commanded Moses, as we read earlier, to send out spies into the promised land and, and preparing for the work that was ahead. And that's in verse 17. Verse 18 and following, it says, And see what the land is like. Here he gives specific direction as they were about to leave. See what the land is like, whether the people dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many. Whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit or are they like camps or are they strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there is forest or not, or and he says, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Bring it back. And he says, this was the first ripe grapes we were in that season. Pretty simple. If you're a spy, this is what you got to do. Okay? Verse 25, they return to give a report of their spying. And they're carrying back this fruit and it takes two of them to carry this one thing of grapes on, the, on a pole. And they come back and they say, you know, it's just what we heard. It's flowing with milk and honey. Um, they tell about the land. They tell about the, they tell about the people. But then they added, the, the people who live there are very powerful. And their cities are fortified and very large. That's fine. Spy, report what you see. Well, they go on in verse 31. We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. Okay, I would have stopped them right there and said, how do you know what you look like to them? You're spies. They should have seen you, one. So you're making that part up. And two, who asked you about if we can attack them? Just report the facts. You're a spy. You're not a commander. You're not the leader. Just report the facts. And again, I'm being too hard on them. Because I do the same thing and you, you do as well. You know, there's so many ways to disobey God. I think I found them all. I'm sad to say. Sometimes we just, dis, we just disobey. And we do less than he's asked us to do. Sometimes we, we, we make a better effort than other times. And we try to do a little. We start, but it's less than he asked us to do. That's still disobedience. Sometimes we do the opposite of what God says. Jonah. He's told to go to He gets on a ship goes the other direction. No way, God. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to Africa. Or I'm not going here. I'm not leaving my family. And we do the opposite. And then sometimes we do more than God asked. And that's what they did here. They spied out. They shared what they saw. And then they began to comment commentaries on, we can't. We shouldn't. We look like this. We look like grasshoppers. We look little. We look small. We look weak. We look... Uh, 
whatever grasshoppers, you know, however you interpret what a grasshopper looks like. Uh, nothing compared to this enemy. Well, on and on they went about how dangerous and desperate the situation was, but neither Moses nor God asked them of their opinion or evaluation on the degree of difficulty that this invasion would be. They were only asked to spy out the land. Why did we get away from that purpose that God gives us? What draws us into that? Well, for one, I'm for sure our pride. This we've done this for God, then we can do anything for God, or we can do as much as the other person. But they moved out of what God asked them to do. They were just asked about the land. They said all this because their fear had strangled their faith. What faith they might have had when they left was just in ER by the time they got back. See, if you don't trust in God, if your faith is not completely in Him, you're not going to follow. Because you just don't see enough at the beginning. And then what you do see is very intimidating in your own strength. That's normal to feel intimidated when God gives you a new task. It should be. Because it should drive us to our knees in dependence on Him for His strength, His guidance, His power to do anything that He's called us to do. We make a commitment to His purpose when we come to the end of ourselves and say, God, will you save me because my purpose, my ways are not working. There has to be more. And you come to that place in your life where you say, there has to be more than what I'm doing. There has to be more than what I'm experiencing right now. And it might be in church, it might be in religion, it might be in a good life, but at some point we say, there's got to be more than this. And there is. And it's that relationship with God. See, Caleb knew that this land they'd scouted was, was not just a good idea. It wasn't a good, just a good plan or a nice dream or some worthwhile project for them. The Lord didn't just tell them to go and check out some property. He said, explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. Do you hear that? Explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving. God was involved in this. This was not just man's plans and dreams and ideas and schemes. God had a purpose in all this. He was involved. And we see Caleb's confidence in God's plan in verse 13, 30. What does he say when they're saying, we can't attack, we'll be torn up, and they're, we look like grasshoppers, blah, blah, blah. He says, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. Let us go up at once and let's possess it. God said he's giving this. This is God's to give, not ours to, to wrestle with from these people, these giants. He knew that if God had promised it, then it, would, it could be done because he believed in the power, the purpose, and the plan of God. And following God, doing God's will, requires we walk in faith. It, it requires it. It's not an option. You see, everybody wants the prize. Everybody wants to go to heaven. We hear that all the time. You hear people talking about, oh, they're in heaven. And everybody wants to go there. Everybody thinks everybody else should go there. Everybody wants peace and joy. And they want, we want it all. But not everybody wants to follow God in faith. And our gospel is being watered down more and more every day where, you know, good thoughts are going to get you to heaven in some people's minds. It's not. The majority of the spies, they were not committed to God's plan. They did what they were asked to do. They did a little bit more, which got them in trouble. But there's this lack of faith and this lack of trust it leads to three things we see real quickly in the first few verses of chapter uh, 14. It leads, in verse 1 and 2, it leads to uh, retreat, I mean resistance. Verse 3, it leads to retreat. And verse 4, it leads to rebellion. It says, All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. They're saying death and slavery... Death in the wilderness would be better than dying here at the hands of these giants. I don't know. I disagree with that, but, you know, I wasn't there. But they were, they were, they're already seeing the resistance. If only we had died. Why did you drag us out to this God-forsaken place 
to leave us here with these giants to contend with. And then we see the retreat. They move a little bit further. Why is the Lord bringing us in the land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So now they've gone to, from just uh, you know, a few questions of resistance. Why, why would God ask me to do that? Have you ever asked that question? Some of us ask probably even a worse question. I bet there's a better way of doing it than the way God is saying. Uh, it leads to this, uh, this passive disobedience where we start looking for other options. What else can I do? To finally in verse 4, and they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt open rebellion where we go another way completely. Matthew Henry said, unbelief overlooks the promises and power of God, magnifies every danger and difficulty, and fills the heart with discouragement. Unbelief. But we see in the midst of all this crowd, multitude of unbelief, we see a commitment to God's plan and Verses 5 and 10 where it says Moses and Aaron, they fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel. Joshua and Caleb, of those who had spied out the land, they tore their clothes and they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel saying, The land which we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. He's almost following the covenant they had with God. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of this land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. And then the glory of the Lord appeared in, a tent, in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. Just before they grabbed stones to remove God's leadership, he appeared. He showed up and put a stop to that. Now, sure, we have to be wise. We have to prepare for the unknown. But you know, our best preparation is knowing and doing the will of God. We can't allow our faith to be replaced with this fear or this fear is so closely related to self-centeredness because you're taking your eyes off God and you're putting it on your own abilities, your own strengths. I mean, look at their words. They said the word we, us, and our, or our, 13 times in seven verses. It's all about we, 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 and us, us, us. We have to decide, again, what are we looking for? Who do we want to please? Do we want to please the crowd? Well, lordship implies pleasing Jesus Christ. Comfort, it implies we're pretty much committed to pleasing ourselves. And you know, as we let God, I'm going to let God do this in your heart and my heart, uh, as he applies his scripture to specific issues, it, it's hard, no doubt about it. It's difficult. I had a friend in my last church who, he had his two kids, his two kids, grown adults, they were both in China serving as missionaries at, at one time. And, you know, that, that was their life. Their children were their lives like they are to most of you that have children. And they were in China, and, and what the daughter, when she first got there, she had some medical things, and they couldn't go help. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't even find that information for several days at, you know, at a time, that kind of deal. But I saw them time and time again trust God and commit their children to the Lord. Well, the people in our text, they came up with their own plan. And their plan involved finding safety, not success, because they were focused on themselves. They allowed their fear to control their future. They'd already shifted in their hearts and were more committed and more concerned about themselves than their God and, and the covenant they had with God, their relationship with God. And this shows us that we, we need to focus on trusting the Lord to lead us, to provide for us, to, to guide us, to help us as we seek to follow him each day, because these things will come. These crowds will turn. Obstacles will appear. It's just part of our walk with God. The thing is, we're walking with him. 
That's the key. We've got to trust him to continue to work and provide and lead and do all that he's done. And again, I sound harsh on them, but we're just, we're no better. We're just as inconsistent as they are. If we're not diligent in our walk, if we're not faithful, if we're not working in our walk daily, we begin to slide. There's, there's just no way to stay in the same position. And when we're sliding, we're moving away from him and moving away from his purpose. And when we do that, we forget. It's strange how we forget. We read them and think, what, what's wrong with these people? Dementia has set into millions of people. They've forgotten about all that God has done in their lives to get them to that place. And yet, when we slow down, when we start to slide, we forget all that God has done in our lives, the ways he's worked, his provisions, blessings. And, and then we begin to quit trusting, and we begin to quit giving and quit serving and just quit following. That retreat signifies that faith has given way to fear. That resisting God's leadership implies that we're more committed to ourselves than God. And that rebellion, you just can't dress it up any other way. It's rebellion against our holy God, our creator. Well, the other spies, they rejected God's plan because they didn't trust in the power and purpose of God. They didn't believe. These are the same people that, again, that with the, the two spies that did, Caleb and Joshua, they, they were in the same place. They've been traveling together. They had the same experiences. They had seen God rescue them through the plagues he sent on the Egyptians. They had seen God hold back the waters of the Red Sea so they could get safely through it. And then he let them go and it destroyed the Egyptian chariots and army. They were there when God led them, this multitude, through the wilderness with that pillar of cloud and day and the pillar of fire at night. They were there when God provided the manna each day and the quail in the desert and the water in the desert. They had all seen that, all experienced that, but somewhere along the way, they lost confidence in God's power, his ability to carry out his plan. Again, we, we take on his plan, and it becomes our plan, and that's when we start falling and tripping up. It needs to be his plan. We need to be committed to his plan. Because I understand how we lose confidence. But how do we get to that degree of complacency and fear 